From being a bill collector and teacher to being the pen behind some of BET's hottest shows, she's establishing her name in the industry. You'll find our guest today contributing work for BET's The Family Business, BET's The Black Hamptons, and Happy on BET Her. Please give a very warm I Do Film welcome to author, producer, and screenwriter extraordinaire, LaGill Hunt. Hi, LaGill. Hi. Thanks for coming today. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So listen, you started off writing just as a stress relief, you know, being a bill collector. Yes. What made you do that? Um... At the time, I was working in collections for the telephone company. Mm -hmm. And people get upset when their phones are disconnected for Mm non-payment. And for some reason, even though they didn't pay their bill, they took it out on me. So I was on the phones day after day. And I was also in a stressful marriage. And one day, a customer snapped on me. And I snapped back without knowing that my supervisor was listening at the time. Oh, my goodness. So all of a sudden, I got a tap on my shoulder. And my supervisor told me to come to her office and I just knew I was about to be fired. So I go to her office and she tells me, Lajo, you need to do something positive with that negative energy. And I was like, okay, what do you want me to do? And she took out a pad and a pen and I said, you want me to write a letter of resignation? She was like, no, you're always reading a book. Why don't you write one? And I went back to my desk and I my coworker at the time had gone on this amazing Valentine's Day date. And she told me about the date. And I was like, this will be a great book. And I started writing. About 32 days later, I had finished my first novel. Wow. Because I was just going to say, what made you get into writing the novels? But I guess <laughs> relieving the stress at work. Yes. And so it wasn't really intentional. No. Alignment. My supervisor told me to do something. My coworker had gone on a date. I had the pen and pad, and I just started writing. It was like I couldn't get the words out fast enough. Wow, wow, amazing. So you went from writing novels to screenwriting shows. How did that pivot look like? How did you pivot? Um, I am an Issa Rae fan, Mm -hmm. and when I'm a fan of someone, I just investigate everything they've ever done. Issa Rae had a fiction podcast called Fruit. A lot of people don't even know about it, but... I became a fan of, of her fiction podcast, and I was thinking like, hmm, maybe I can do this. So I actually created my own fiction podcast, and it was called Soulless, and that introduced me to screenwriting because I had to write a script for the fiction podcast. About a few months after I had started doing Soulless, my boss, who's actually my co-writer, told me that BET had taken one of our book series and turned it into a TV show. So luckily, because he said, well, we're going to have to hire writers. And I was like, I know how to write. He was like, no, write scripts. I said, I know how to write scripts. (laughs) So he said, you do? And I said, yes, I do. So sure enough, I proved to him that I knew how to write scripts and we started writing. I became a writer in the family business. Right. So that means that that became your first big break moment. That was my first big break moment. And that phone conversation when you got that big break? Um, It was one of many because actually that is how we write the scripts and the books. We do everything over the phone because he's by coasting in either LA or New York. And at the time I was in Virginia and I'm in Atlanta. So technology has proven a great asset for us in what we do. So who is he? Carl Weber. Okay, so that (laughs) takes me to my next question. I just want to make sure so the audience would know. So you've written novels and you've created TV shows with Carl Weber. Yes. How did you guys connect? Uh, After I wrote my first novel, um, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. So I went to a black bookstore in Virginia Beach and the manager at the time was like, well, what are you going to do with it? And I was like, I don't know. He said, are you going to self-publish? And I said, I guess, yes. So he said, well, you're going to need a distributor. And he took out a business card and he wrote a phone number on the back. And he said, this is a distribution company in New York. Well, when I called the number, it wasn't a distribution company. He had accidentally given me Carl Weber's cell phone number. That wasn't accidental. Oh, yeah. That was definitely (laughs) God's plan. So 
I thought I was talking to, to a distributor. We talked on the phone for like 45 minutes because he was like, well, tell me about your novel. And I told him about it. And then at the end of the phone conversation, he was like, I think I might want to help you. And I was like, okay, you're going to distribute my book? He was like, I'm not a distributor. I'm an author. And I said, okay, what's your name? He was like, Weber. I said, Weber, is that your first or your last name? He was like, it's my last name. My first name is Carl. I said, oh my God, one of my favorite author's names is Carl Weber. He was like, yeah, that's me. I was like, you are not Carl Weber. He was like, yeah, I am. So he really had to convince me that he was Carl Weber. But sure enough, I became the first author signed to Carl Weber's publishing company, Urban Books, back in 2003. Wow. Talk about yeah. faith. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we've been writing together since that time. Yes. Well, I'm sure as a writer, you know, you've experienced what they call writer's block. How do you overcome that? Uh, two things. Um, my writing mentor, who is Victoria Christopher Murray, she tells us to read our favorite book at least three times a year. So when I get writer's block, writer's block I'm sorry, I will reread my favorite novel. And that is? And that is Chocolate Star by Sheila Copeland. Oh, I love that book. <laughs> yes. Yes. Or I'll Take Manhattan by Judith Krantz. Okay. Uh, so I'll read both of those. Or I will call one of my best friends and say, girl, what's going on? And they will always give me some book material that I can use that will pull me out of that fog. And usually how long does that take for you to come out of writer's block? I mean, I'm sure if they it's got good tea, if okay. they got good tea, okay. oh, it does not take long mm -hmm. because my friends have a lot of drama. So that allows you to move away from what you're writing on, right? Listen to them and then come back. Yes. So what, is there some point where you didn't really know where the direction was going and you got some really good tea and then you came back what book came out of it i actually stopped writing for seven years wow and it was another friend of mine that would call me and say lajill you owe it to your fans you have to come back and i was like i don't want to do it it's not fun for me anymore and he was like but you can make it fun again and so he proposed to me, he said, I tell you what, write me a short story and let me publish it. And sure enough, a friend of mine had some really good drama and it was less overwhelming to do a short story than to write a full novel. And I wrote a short story called Repeat Offenders. To this day, I believe it is probably the best thing I've ever written because it just came from a place of authenticity and I didn't have any aspirations or goals for it. I was just writing a short story and there was no pressure, no stress, and the story just came out naturally. Wow, so seems like some good advice you would wanna tell the listeners out there, even if you, you know, kind of walk away from it for a minute, write a short story. Exactly. And get back and into the game. You don't have to look at it as like, I have to write the next great American novel. Mm -hmm. Just write what comes naturally. Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, they say, I want to write a book. What do I need to do? Commit to writing 15 minutes a day. You don't need a laptop. You can go to the Dollar Tree, get a notebook and a pen. I write everything by pen, by hand first. And because it's easier to get what's in your head mm -hmm. out onto the paper when you use your hand. Just get it from your head onto the paper. Worry about punctuation. Worry about editing. Worry about all that later. Just get what's in your head out onto the paper. At least 15 minutes. 15 minutes a day. So that goes to what type of advice, what type of advice would you um, tell the audience out there um, about uh, how to properly network in this industry? Um, because I think, you know, by you being, by someone being able to tell you, mm -hmm. you know, go back and, and, and write a short film that was somebody in your network. So how important is that? Pretty much, um, get out there, like, and reach out to your favorite authors, uh, work on your craft, take writing classes. Like to this day, I still do, I attend workshops. Mm -hmm. I attend like festivals. 
and I take classes because just like any other industry, the writing industry is always changing and you can always do better. So I surround myself by those writers that I enjoy reading mm -hmm. and I try to learn from them. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Surround yourself, build you a tribe. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I want to jump into a little something before I go into the next phase of what uh, you have going on. It's called This or That. Okay. Yes. Mardi Gras in New Orleans or Mardi Gras in Mobile, Alabama? Mardi Gras in Mobile, Alabama. Hands down. I grew up in Mobile. It is a huge family reunion. I get to see my family, my friends. I get to party with them. I get to love on them. They get to love on me. It is very family friendly and it's home. There is no place like home. Absolutely. And, <laughs> and on top of that, it originated. It originated Mobile, the birthplace of Mardi Gras. Mobile, Alabama celebrated Mardi Gras before Louisiana was even a state. Wow. That's some great history to know. Mm -hmm. Passenger seat or driver's seat? Driver's seat because I have anxiety <laughs> and I need to know that I am safe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> owning, owing someone money or owing someone a favor? Ooh, owing someone. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I'd rather... I'd rather owe you money because ain't no telling what that favor going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hmm. Girlfriends or guy friends? Ooh. Ooh. Hmm. Depends on the situation. When it comes to dating advice and financial <laughs> advice, mm -hmm. guy friends. When it comes to someone having your back and you can count on and, you know... Through thick and thin, like the song says, mm -hmm. girlfriends. Definitely girlfriends. Yeah. <laughs> writing books or writing for TV? Oh, oh, oh. Writing for TV is easier for me because yes. dialogue is my strength. Okay. But writing books is more artistic for me because I'm not limited to locations. I can write about someone being in Abu Dhabi. I can write about somebody being in a club. When you write for television, you got to think budget. Mm -hmm. And so even like, you, uh, even like you said, writing for the book, because you can take it. Writing for the book, 99% of the time, is just you writing, right? Mm -hmm. But then when you're writing for like TV shows and things like that, you have more people to collaborate with. Well, yes. And you also have to think, when you're writing for television, you have to, there is a limitation. Like when you are writing for a television show for a one hour episode, you only get like 44 pages. Mm -hmm. I can write a 300 page book. So there's more freedom in writing a book than there is. And I think writing that book, we get a little bit more. Of you get a lot of your background. creativity, yes. everything you want in the book. So you describe your novel as contemporary women's fiction with an urban flair. I am a black woman writing modern day black stories featuring black women and black love. Recently, we've seen an uptick, right? Mm -hmm. On black entertainment in terms of television. What makes your work stand out um, or makes it different from others? Uh, I think my work is very relatable. I create these memorable characters that people enjoy mm -hmm. that when you... Much like when you read my novel, people can say, like, I feel like I know that person. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, it's probably because you do. Because yes. I write about my family, friends. I write about my own situations. But I want to write relatable stories. Mm -hmm. Even if it's about, you know, a family that has, like, multi lives in a multi-million dollar mansion. All families have drama. Yes. All siblings go through things. All Parents have issues with their children. And so even though I write about these characters that, you know, may not be where you are, you can still relate to them because you feel like, oh, my gosh, that was me and my mom. Like, or that was me and my brother or that was me and my friends. So I want people to feel like, oh, my gosh, I really I really could be in a legit hunt project because I can relate to what's going on. So when you um, have you ever wrote 
um, a book and it was about some family members and they read it and saw themselves in it and knew exactly <laughs> that you were talking about them. Yes. I have friends right now that say I owe them royalties <laughs> because, and here's another thing. And I tell them all the time, I never wrote to be published. I never, in a, it never dawned on me to write a book. Mm -hmm. When I did write it, I wrote it to entertain my coworkers at work. So when the book came out and they recognized themselves, I was like, I didn't know it was going to be published. Like this just happened. So yeah, they say that I, I owe them royalties because yeah, sure. they probably like, Oh, this is how you feel. Oh, yeah. this is what you see <laughs> you know, when you're writing for us. Yes. In a perfect world, if you were to make a perfect movie, what would it be about and who would you cast in it? Oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, well, as a screenwriter, I'm the low man on the totem pole, so I don't get to pick the cast members. Okay. okay. <laughs> I aspire to be an executive producer to get to make that decision. What would I write about? Oh my gosh. I will probably write what I'm currently writing in my novels, write about like friendship and the ups and downs and parenting. Um, I aspire to write a rom-com featuring some seasoned black talent. I think there's a lack of seasoned love in, on black television. Mm -hmm. So people in the, because I think our, our children need to see that. And we, as you know, getting up there in age, I would love to see like a 65 year old couple falling in love, like, and, and you know, and see it through their eyes and their vein. Oh, let's see, who would I cast? Oh, um, I cannot think of her name. Oh, so many like great season talent. And, and um, I don't even want to call this season, but definitely Felicia Rashad. Yes. I would definitely cast her. Uh, I'm trying to see who else would I cast. Oh, the guy that's the State Farm, or is it All State Man, Dennis? Yes. Like With the deep voice. I, yes, I would cast him and Debbie Allen. The um, greats. Yes, I would cast like the Grace in an amazing, dope season Black Love rom com. I want to go back because you said that um, we don't have enough of these type of shows uh, or sees enough of black love. Why do you think that is right now? I mean, reality TV is kind of like taking over and it can get a little raunchy sometimes, mm -hmm. but what is it because of what the culture wants to see right now? Pretty much it is. Uh, I know there are a lot of dark, twisted suspense, thriller, horror. A lot of people are eating that up. Mm -hmm. Um, I've expressed to the network that one of the reasons why the viewership for black women on Hallmark is so high is because we don't have the opportunities to see that on networks that are targeting a black audience. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would like to, to like, I'm a Hallmark chick. Me too. So <laughs> Hallmark is winning right now with us. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. And I am blessed to be able to kind of fill those spaces at this point um, with what I am doing now. But I think we do need I we do need that. Well, we're we're waiting. <laughs> we're waiting for you to bring and it. And I us. am stepping up, filling that void. Yes. So I hear that you're a big fan of reality TV. Would you ever step into the reality TV realm behind the scenes? Behind the scenes? Yes. Maybe. Yes. I, you know, I think I have some, some re great reality TV ideas. Yes. Well, we don't want to spill them because no. we don't want nobody to take them. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you could create your reality TV show, what would it be about and who would you cast? Ooh. What would it be about? Now, don't tell you. No. The real thing. <laughs> <laughs> it would be about parenting adults. 
And who would I cast? Uh, probably my own children. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you mine too. <laughs> Yes. Kids and adults, that would be really interesting. Yes. Mm-hmm. They're very relatable. Woo! That's, mm, mm-hmm. that's quite entertaining. Yes. <laughs> Every day in the household. Every day. <laughs> so, would you? What's next for you? I am stepping into the producer role. Mm-hmm. So, I am um, working on a couple of independent projects. And continuing the part the series that I already have now, which is the family business and the Black Hamptons, which I'm not supposed to say it's my favorite, but it really is because like it Black is my Hamptons. own personal dynasty with Black people. Yes. Uh, and I currently have a faith-based film that just wrapped okay. called The Final Say. Which is beautiful. It's a beautiful story. The title is nice. Yes, because we all know God has a final say. Yes, he does. He does. And I also have another um, mental health focused uh, film that we are shooting uh, this year as well. What's so important about the mental health? Or not, no. Why is it so important about the mental health today? And... um, being really relevant right now with you making that film? I think that mental health in the black community is taboo. We don't talk about it enough. I believe that because I have the opportunity to put projects in front of people, that maybe if we see other people dealing with those same issues, it won't be as taboo. And we can talk about it and cause and create conversation Because a lot of times when we think mental health in the black community, we focus on the obvious, which is like suicide and bipolar. But there are other mental health issues that we deal with in the black community that go unaddressed all the time. So not to discount or downplay those other issues, but I wanted to show other mental health issues that people deal with every single day and we've just brushed over them or we we don't address them in the black community because it's like oh well this is just who that person is yeah Mm -hmm. so i'm glad to know that you're going to tap into other aspects of mental health yes like you said besides um suicide or some sort especially when it comes to our black men Mm -hmm. Um, so i can't wait to see that on the big screen yes and um and be another platform for you to go all the way around the world and to show people and talk about it that's very important in this day and time and um every time you turn on the news you know you're seeing something in regards to it yes and so hopefully you know just sitting right here when you just just sitting right here hopefully not only will our community see it but the ones who enforce us uh, when they're called out, and I'm going to say like the police or some sort, mm-hmm. that they can, you know, really learn who we are, learn um, different signs, and hopefully it would be a light to them as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. Make recognizable. Yes. And I think that's, that's, that's key. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when can we expect another season of The Family Business <laughs> and The Black Hamptons? When BET says you guys can get another season, <laughs> but we are currently working on the scripts. So once the network tells us we are all ready, we have done ready, we have done set, we're just waiting to pull the trigger and go. Oh, I'm going to be waiting on it because I love the Hamptons. <laughs> it is the modern day uh, dynasty. It the is. Dynasty. Yes. I like, mm-hmm. I'm not supposed to say that. I yeah. have a fave, mm-hmm. but oh, I love it. I love Vanessa Bell Calloway does a phenomenal job. Lamont Rucker, Karan Riley, like I they it is always so satisfying when you write scripts mm-hmm. and then the talent takes it to another level. Like it there is nothing like seeing talent execute those lines perfectly wow. the way that you wrote them. And do they usually stick to the way 
the lines the way you write? Usually they do, but even when they do their own thing, it's it's like, yay. (laughs) Well, tell our audience out there, you know, how they can follow you. Okay. I'm actually on Facebook as LaJill Hunt. I am on Instagram as LL Cool Jill. Yes, I love it. <laughs> and I am on Twitter as LA Cool Jill. I live tweet television shows. So follow me. We have a great time. Like you said, I'm a reality TV fan. So when those reality TV shows come on, I'm like, click, 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 click on Twitter. So oh, that's good yes. to know. Yes. You hear that audience? Jump on Twitter when you're watching those reality TV shows and tune in to LaGill as she, you know, takes us probably into a whole nother (laughs) realm of thinking about the show uh, that we see on TV. Yes. I would like to thank you for coming on to I Do Film with Cardelia. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to the next Black Hamptons as well as the family business. Thank you. I can't wait for you to see it. Thank you so much. Yes.